But I believe those great days ahead, are, I believe that those are the greatest days ahead because of the faithfulness of today. And we can't neglect the truth or uh, back up or walk away from the truth for any amount of time. We must continue to be faithful. And I believe God will continue to bless as long as we do that. And the blessing comes from God. And we always understand that. But it is a result of our faithfulness. And so continue to be faithful to the Lord. Ask God to help you. Uh, you know, sometimes you can't take it year by year. Sometimes you don't take it even, you know, week by week. Sometimes you have to take it moment by moment. By faith, moment by moment. But you keep taking each step by faith, moment by moment. And those moments will turn into days and days into weeks and weeks, months, months, years. And God will give you a lifetime of blessing, I promise. I enjoy serving the Lord, I do. Uh, I, I do believe that Christians ought to be happy. Paul was happy. Amen. Caden, you're already under conviction, man. You need to get right with the Lord. Amen. Moving down there by dad. Amen. Now, if I have an illustration tonight, you're right in the right spot, so I'll use this. So be ready. Be watching. You know, Paul said he was happy. In prison, he was happy because it was the Lord that brought that joy. I believe Christians ought to be happy. I believe we should allow the joy of the Lord to flood our soul and to flow out of our life and let around, people around us see that. But, you know, anytime you try to do something for God, the devil's going to try to stop you. How many of you know that? How many of you know this year, you know what, we made up our mind, you know, and maybe in your home you said, you know, we're, we're going to do this for the Lord. My family and I made up our mind this year as a family. We're going to read through the Bible together this year as a family. And I promise you, anytime you make up your mind you're going to do something for the Lord, the devil is going to do all he can to stop you. Maybe you've made up your mind, hey, we're going to do something different this year. We're going to be more faithful. We're going to give. We're going to be faithful in the service. We're going to ask the Lord to help us with that besetting sin. And boy, the moment you determine you're going to do that, there's the devil waiting on you. The adversary doing all he can to try to discourage you. know. The Bible brings us to a story just like that in the book of Ezra tonight. Ezra chapter number 4. Look what the Bible says. We'll begin reading in verse number 1 of Ezra. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. We do sacrifice unto him ever since the days of Ezra Haddon, king of Asher, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua, the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel, said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us, to build a house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as the king, of Cyrus, as the king Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah, and troubled them in building. And hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight. I pray that you would use this passage to encourage us, to give us exactly what we need to lift us up. And Lord, we ask God that you would speak to us, use this service tonight to make us Christians that are strong in the Lord. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Every Christian's natural response to the work of God in their life is spiritual growth. The natural response to the working of God in our life is spiritual growth. When we find ourselves in church and the Word of God is preaching and we begin to move in the wrong direction, it's a good indication that there's something wrong in our life. There's a problem that we must address. There's an issue that we must deal with. Isn't it interesting sometimes that when things begin to go wrong or things begin to take place that we did not expect or things turn out the way we didn't expect them to turn out, that the first thing we want to do is find the person or the reason to blame for the outcome. We want to be able to point a finger and we want to find someone who said or did something to cause what took place in our life. The Bible says here that the nation of Israel had done nothing. The, the people of Judah rebuilding the city of Jerusalem had done nothing to, to deserve or to begin the process that was brought on to them by the adversaries. They had done nothing except build for God. They weren't out there trying to start a fight. They weren't out there trying to point a finger at someone else. They were just simply determining in their own life, I'm going to build 
for God. As a matter of fact, if you find, you don't have to turn there, but in the previous chapter, you'll see that, listen, they built the altar and they laid the foundations. And the Bible says in chapter 4, when the adversaries heard, they said, hey, we want to come build with you. And, and of course, in the wisdom that, that Zerubbabel had and Joshua had, they said, no, 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 the God that you serve is not the God that we serve. We'll build to our God and you continue doing whatever you're doing. They had done nothing except build for God. Anytime you determine you're going to grow for the Lord, the adversary is going to try to hinder it. Anytime you decide, I'm going to be more faithful, I'm going to be more right with God, I'm going to be more committed to God's will, I'm going to do what it is that God has asked me to do. Anytime you determine to grow in the Lord or build on your faith, the adversary is going to be waiting. The adversary is subtle, isn't he? We learned about the adversary last week. The Bible tells us here, as a matter of fact, go to Ezra chapter number 1. I want to point out a verse to you, and then we'll come back to Ezra chapter number 4. Ezra chapter number 1, in verse number 6, we, we pick this story up at the beginning. We go back to the beginning, and here's what the Bible tells us. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands. The Bible tells us to be strong in the Lord. They were making preparation. They were they were getting ready to do what they knew God had put in their heart to do. You know, before you ever see a building built, there's much preparation that takes place. As a matter of fact, some of the most difficult decisions are made before we ever see one spade of dirt overturned. Some of the most challenging choices are made before you ever see any evidence of growth. Can I, can I encourage you in your Christian life? Some of the most important choices you will ever make will be the choices that you make at the beginning of your spiritual walk with the Lord. Some of the most important decisions you will ever make, you will, ever, you will make before you ever see any evidence of growth. Before you ever see the building built, before you ever see the plant bloom, before you ever reap a harvest, someone has to dig the ground and plant the seed. You know, sometimes in our life, if we're not careful... God established the earth and God established what we know as agriculture. And he said the seed would be planted and the, the ground would nourish it and the rain would nourish it. And it would bring forth fruit. And oftentimes, if we're not careful, in new Christians, we want to plant the seed and reap the harvest all in the same moment. And I says, well, that person got saved. And when we get saved, we're different. But you know, a lot of times it takes time for the evidence of that salvation to come to fruition in our life. We have to grow up in the Lord. And some of the most important decisions you will ever make, you will make before anyone ever sees evidence of those decisions. I remember as a young man growing up that our youth pastors and our Christian school teachers and our preacher used to say to us, listen, you have to determine what you're going to do before you ever have to make the decision to do it. When it comes to the relationships that you're in and the people you let influence your life, you can't wait till you're in that moment of passion or you're in that moment where the adrenaline's flowing and, and you say, you know, this is what I'm going to do. No, those decisions must be made before those moments arrive. And so the Bible tells us here that they strengthened their hands. They were making preparation. They were planning to do something for God. But if you turn to Ezra chapter number 4, back to Ezra chapter number 4, the Bible says in verse number 4, look please, then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah. They weakened the hands of the people of Judah. Tactics the devil uses to hinder God's building. Tactics the devil uses to hinder God's building. You say, Pastor Brian, why do we build? Why, do we, why should there be growth in our life? Well, we see that, first of all, in verse number 3. Look there, please. He says, but, but Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us. Mark that down there, please, if you would, and write this down. Why do we build, number one, the command of Scripture? The command of Scripture. You know, the Bible says that we're to be strong in the Lord. We're to grow in the Lord. We're to build onto our faith. Or we're to build uh, uh, upon your faith. We're to add to our faith. Build up one another. The Bible says there's growth, a natural response to God's working is growth. But the Bible also tells us here that in this passage that there were many adversaries that said, hey, let us come get in line with you. Let's just all join hands together 
and do something for God. It's amazing that the wisdom that we see in the chief, uh, the Zerubbabel and the chief of the fathers there of Israel, the wisdom that we see there is often wisdom that's neglected in our world. The Bible says, no, 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 wait a minute. Your God is not our God. Be very careful about these groups that want you to line up and hold hands because we all love God. Ooh. God works through His local church. And listen, I'm for helping people and I'm for trying to be the best example that I can be for the Lord. But not everybody who hangs a shingle on the side of their building and calls himself a church is serving the God uh, that you and I serve, the God of the Bible. And the, the Father said, hey, wait a minute. No, no, we're not going to yoke up and hold hands. The Bible says... Be not unequally yoked together as the manner of some is. You and I often think, well, when we think about that, we think about relationships as individuals. But we need to be careful what we attach ourselves to as Christians. Amen. We love that word liberty. I've got liberty in Christ. I can live and operate and do anything that I want to because I have liberty in Jesus Christ. That's taken out of context when it's used that way. That way, a matter of fact, it's more than taken out of context. It's abused because the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ is not the liberty to live any way that we want to, but it is the liberty to live by choice in a way that is honoring to Jesus Christ. And he says, oh, wait a minute. There's a command of Scripture. You say, how do we, how do we, how do we filter? How do we measure the things that we are to allow impact, to impact or influence our life. And it must always go back to the Scripture. It must always go back to, it must always return to the commands of Scripture. You see, the easy thing in a Christian life is this, is knowing what God said. That's the easy part of the Christian life. The challenging part is doing it. The command of Scripture said, no, no, we're not, we're not going to just yoke up with everybody. We're going to be faithful and we're going to be true and we're going to be pure in our doctrine. And listen, there is, there's a fad. This, this thing of, Christian, uh, of religion is a fad. Everybody, everybody wants Jesus when they need him. Are you following me? You understand what I'm saying? Everybody wants Jesus when they need him. Everybody wants to call on God in the time of emergency. But the Christian life is more than that. And how do we determine what we let influence our life? We have to go back to the Scripture. We see, secondly, not only this, when we think about why we build, we, or how, how we're going to build, there, there's the command of Scripture. But look, if you would please, in the second part of verse number 3. He says, Ye have nothing to do with us to build the house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel. Boy, I love their commitment to serve, right? He said, we're going to build. Listen, that's why we serve. We don't serve because Pastor Brian asked us. By the way, if your pastor asks you to do something, you ought to do it. Amen. Amen. Just like kids, if an adult tells you something, you ought to do it. I was telling you just recently about one of our young boys. He said, I asked him to do something. He said, no, nah, not today. I'm glad she was asking and not somebody else. I can't even imagine saying that, Brother Donnie, to my dad. Somebody asked me to do, I can't imagine Brother Charles coming along to me and I was eight, nine, ten year old boy. And they said, uh, you know, hey, can you help me do this? And I said, ah, not today. I can't even imagine what that ended like. You follow what I'm saying? When I was a young man, dad said, listen, the adult tells you to do something, you get it done. When I was a young man, when you got in trouble at school, you got spanked at home, Josiah, you got uh, spanked at school, you got spanked at home. Bad thing for you, you're homeschooled, man. You get spanked at school and you get spanked at home, and they're both the same place. <laughs> he says there's a commitment to service. He said we are serving the Lord. Their commitment to service. Some people think their service is to a group of people. Some people think their service is even to a, an individual, to a pastor. Some people think their service is, no, no, when we teach a Sunday school class, we're teaching that class for the Lord. When we drive a bus route, we're driving that bus for the Lord. When we sing in a choir, we're singing for the Lord. He said, we're going to build this house for the Lord. There's a commitment to service. Understand something, Christian. Your commitment is not to a church or to a man or to a ministry first. You should have that commitment, but that is not first. It is the Lord that must always be first. 
He says there's the command of Scripture. He says there's the commitment of service. Why we build? How are we going to build? We have to be committed in our service. And listen, you can't jump in and out and up and down. We're here one week and listen, you know, I got my feelings hurt this week and you know, I'm thinking about praying about coming to church next week. Listen, that's not the kind of Christianity that builds. It's a commitment service. But the tactics the devil uses to keep us from building, we find in the next verse. We know it is right to build because we've been commanded. We know if we're going to build, we have to be committed. But what does Satan do to try to keep us from building? He tells us in the next verse. We'll be very quick. Look what the Bible says. Look at with me, if you would, please, in verse number 4. Are you there? The Bible says, so here's what happens. The people of the land come and say, hey, we want to build. God's already labeled them as adversaries. And by the way, I'll just go with the label God gives them. And we ought to use that tactic all throughout Scripture. If God calls them unrighteous, it doesn't matter what we think, they're unrighteous. If God calls it sin, it doesn't matter our opinion, it is sin. We'll just go with what God said. And so the Bible says that the Lord labeled them adversaries, and they come, and they say, we want to build. And the fathers, having wisdom, said, no, no, we're not going to go that direction. Just a few moments ago, I met with our leadership team, and I sat down with them. I said, hey, I need some wisdom. I need some input. And we made some decisions and made some choices, and, and I'm glad that we have that. And, and we set the course, and oftentimes in our life, we hear and we know what God says we are to do, knowing what God wants us to do. But we, get, we allow the things of this world to come between us and, and God, and, and we just would be better off if we just kept it where God keeps it. Just stay the course that God has given us. And so he says here to them, you can't build with us. So they get upset, and they, here's what they said. Well, if you're not going to let me build, I'm going to make it a problem. That's what they said. Verse number four. If you're not going to give me what I want, I'm just going to make you miserable. That tactic's still true today, isn't it? How many of you know that tactic's true? It can enter in any one of our lives. We don't get our way. We're going to make it miserable for everybody. The Bible says here, look at verse number four. Then, you can't build with us. We're going to build according to what we've been given. Then the people of the land. Remember chapter one, verse number six. The Bible says they strengthened their hands. But in verse number four, the Bible says the people of the land weakened their hands. That literally means discouragement. So if I can't get what I want, I'm going to discourage you from doing what God wants for you. They use discouragement. Number one, the tactics the devil used, discouragement. The Bible says they weakened their hands. They weakened their hands. Discouragement is a, is a real thing, isn't it? You know, we're to be strong in the Lord, the Bible says, but oftentimes while we understand and we quote that verse and we're encouraged by that verse, we forget that the Lord says, listen, be not weary in well-doing. God says, listen, there are going to come times when you're going to get weary. And, and Brother Mitch, just trying to keep the course and stay the course and keep the, the ship going the right direction, it takes work and it takes effort. And you'll get discouraged and you'll get tired and you'll get weary. And man, when you get weary, guess what? The devil's not going to say, oh, let's get in the break. No, what's the devil going to do? He's going to pour it on thicker. He's going to continue to discourage you. The Bible says he weakened their hands. What did we build with? They built with their hands. What did Satan attack? The very thing that God was using to grow them. You know what Satan's always going to attack in your life? The very thing that God is using to grow you. You say, Pastor Brian, how's that happen? Isn't it interesting sometimes how the devil will come to us and attack the word of God in our life? You say, well, Pastor Brian, I don't believe anything the devil says. No, you may not believe anything that he says, but you'll take and you'll set this book down somewhere where it doesn't impact your life. We'll put it someplace where it becomes unimportant to us, where we don't see it. We don't have to face it. We don't have to deal with it. How many of us have ever done that, you know, in something in our life? Sometimes maybe for men it's a garage, or maybe for the ladies it's, it's uh, now don't get upset, ladies, it's just reality. Maybe it's the laundry room, all right? That doesn't mean that men can't do laundry and all that kind of good stuff. We have to preface every statement we make in today's world. Amen. Maybe it's a laundry room. Maybe it's a garage. Here's what we'll do. You know what? I'm going to close the door so I don't have to look at that because I'll deal with it later. And isn't that how we use, do the Bible sometimes? I'll put it somewhere. I'll put it. I'll set it. I'll, I'll just set it somewhere. That way I don't have to look at it. Because then it doesn't influence my life. He may not come to you and say, hey, God is a liar. But he may come to you and say, you know what? That Bible's not as important as that preacher makes it out to be. 
it's not as important as it needs to be in your life. He'll use the very thing that God is using to grow you is what Satan will attack in your life. Have you ever thought about some of the people that are closest to you that God has put into your life? Maybe a spouse. Maybe a husband. Maybe a wife. Sometimes our children. Your pastor. A Sunday school teacher. Those are the things that Satan will cause you to attack. The very thing he's wanting to use to grow you. That God is wanting to use to grow you. The Bible says he weakened their hands. He used discouragement. The Bible commands us that we're to bear ye one another's burdens. When we see our brother or sister discouraged, the response is not to be, well, you know what, they're getting what they deserve. Well, I know what that person's really like. That's not the way Christians are to respond. By the way, you're not getting what you deserve. I'm not getting what I deserve. The Bible says they, Satan attacked their hands. He weakened their hands. The adversary attacked their hands. The very thing that God was using to grow them. That's why when things come along, you would be much wiser rather than laying out of church to get in church. Rather than running from times when God can influence your life, you need to have more of those times. Instead of closing your Bible or, or drifting off into la-la land, you should stop and say, God, let me hear from you because the very thing that God wants to use to grow you is the thing that Satan wants to weaken in your life. The second thing, the second tactic that the devil uses, look with me back there again, if you would please, in Ezra chapter number 4, in verse number 4 again. Ezra chapter number 4, verse number 4. The Bible says, And the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. And troubled them in building. The second thing or tactic that Satan likes to use is not only discouragement, but Satan's a master at distraction. The Bible says he, they troubled them. And I read that passage, Brother Tim, and here's what I thought about. I thought about a, 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 a wife or a mother. Let me be politically correct here. Or a husband mopping a floor and a child walking in with dirty feet. Here's what you're trying to accomplish, but here's this child who who's, has no clue, you know, their feet are dirty, and, and they're, they're going in there, and they mess up everything you just did. And instead of doing and accomplishing what you intended to accomplish, you have to go back and redo what you've already done because somebody got distracted. Honey, before you come in, wipe your feet. Isn't it interesting? How many have boys in your home? You have boys in your home? How many have laundry bins in your home? You have laundry bins in your home. And you tell the boys, put the clothes in the laundry bin. And it's a miracle how the clothes can wind up everywhere in the vicinity of the laundry bin, but not in the laundry bin. And what happens is you're slowed from accomplishing the task that you need to accomplish because you have to go back and do what should have already been done, but somebody got distracted. So as a matter of fact, turn with me if you would, please to the Gospel of Luke. Turn forward in your Bible there to the Gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, I want you to see something. Everybody still with me? All right. Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter number 10. And look down with me, if you would, please, in verse number 38. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village... And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. And look what the Bible says, and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And look what the Bible says. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. Thou art careful and troubled about many things. You know what he said to her? He said, Martha, you're distracted. He said, you're busy doing a lot of things. He said, but you're distracted. You say, how do you know that he's saying that? Because look at the very next verse. Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. Boy, that's us as Christians, isn't it? We get busy and we get going and doing and... And here's what we're doing. We're busy serving, Brother Elmer. 
and we're serving, but we've never stopped to sit at the feet of Jesus to hear his word. And all of our serving is in our own strength. And the Lord says, Martha, you're busy and you're, you're doing. He says, but you're distracted because there's one thing that's needful. Look, and Mary hath chosen that. Look what the Bible says. And Mary hath chosen that good part. Get this which shall not be taken away from her. Stop for just a moment. Have you ever recognized, Brother Tim, how often we, we're busy and we're busy and we do? Like I said just a moment ago, we'll mop a floor and we'll sweep a floor and we'll paint a room. And you know what happens? Eventually, we're going to have to come back and sweep that floor again. We're going to have to mop that floor again. We're going to have to paint that room again. We're going to have to do all that again. Why? Because marks and scars are all going to come. Dirt's going to come in. But what God puts into our life can never be taken from us. He says there's one thing that's needful. You know, often we use the excuse that I got to do this, and I got to do this, and oftentimes, and, and even in our ministry here personally, there are times that people need to stop and sit at Jesus' feet. Sometimes the pastor needs to say, hey, I, I don't want you to do that anymore. I want you to just sit, and I want you to let Jesus speak to your heart. I want you to stop, stop being busy doing and going and using that as a substitute for your spiritual walk because nothing can do for you what Jesus can do for you. He said the Bible says, listen, you're, you're troubled and you're busy. He said, but you've been distracted because there's one thing that's needful. And that one thing, Mary has chosen the good. The Bible says that can never be taken away from her. Boy, wouldn't it be so much better if we got what we needed from God so that we could go and serve rather than trying to serve without having anything from God? You follow what I'm saying? Wouldn't it be so much better in our homes if we tried to lead with God's presence and with God's power rather than trying to lead without God's presence and God's power? We get distracted. Satan wants to distract you. He wants to get your focus on things that are unimportant, that really do not matter, that you're going to have to do over and over and over again. And you miss the one thing that's needful. The last thing will be done. The Bible says here that the tactics that Satan uses is discouragement. He also uses distraction, the Bible says, and troubled them in building. And look in verse number 5. You know, the world never stops. The devil never stops. The Bible says in verse number 5, and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. Hire counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. The last thing that I want to give you that Satan uses to hinder tactics the devil uses to hinder God's building, discouragement, distraction. The last thing the Bible says, look, to frustrate their purpose. The last thing is division. But well, when you get frustrated, it won't take long before you'll start to make an enemy out of people that were never your enemy. Sometimes we as men are guilty of this. We'll have a bad day. and We'll be bothered about the day. We'll feel like we're not living up to what we ought to be living up to or accomplishing what we ought to be accomplishing. And we'll come home. And instead of dealing with the person who has the issue, which is us, we'll get frustrated with the kids. Or frustrated with the church. Or frustrated with the circumstances or finances. We'll get frustrated. And, and what happens? Division comes. Church, you mark her down. We will not sacrifice the church that God has given us. We won't sacrifice what God has already done. For the sake of something new. Let me say that again. We will not sacrifice what God has already done for the sake of something new. We're not going to get distracted on what we want. We're going to sit at the feet of Jesus and understand there's one thing that's needful, Chase, and that's to be right where God wants us to be. And when division comes, when the enemy comes and he, he causes division, he seeks to separate us. We'll be aware of it. The Bible says they hired. There's always someone to do the devil's dirty work. Mark it down, please. Don't forget it. There's always someone willing 
to do the devil's dirty work. They hired someone. They hired counselors against him to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, the king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. All the, all the days of the king, the Bible says they frustrated him. They brought division among them. They tried to separate those that should be serving the same God. You be careful. You be careful who shows up to do the devil's dirty work in your life. Isn't it interesting sometimes how what God, what, what God is trying to do in our life, the devil will use to, to accuse. Think about it. Let me give you some logic. My sons take a logic class. And uh, they have debates sometimes. And I try to help them and encourage them to blow the other side away. I do, man. I give, them, I give them pointers. They had a debate one time about a biblical issue. I said, let me help you out, man. I pretty much gave them three points and a poem and an invitation. Hoping everybody in there gets saved. Amen. But a God-called preacher has one purpose. And that's to preach the truth of God's word to the people of God. So that the people of God can be equipped to do the work of God. You follow me? To preach the truth of God's word to the people of God so the people of God can be equipped to do the word of, work of God. And yet, when that book is preached, and someone gets separated from God in their life, there's division between where God wants them and where they are. It's amazing how quickly that the person that God has put into their life to help grow them for the Lord is the one they become accusing of. The wife that God has given you, or the husband that God has given you, or the teacher that God has given you. The devil's gonna, gonna put a finger on that person and say, Hey, you need to separate from them. Don't find yourself separated from where God wants you. Don't find yourself separated from the will of God. Don't find yourself following the counselors. The Bible says counselor there. I'm reminded of the word attorney. And have you ever sat down with an attorney, like at a house signing? or when they want you to sign something, and they read something, and you think, what in the world did they just say? What does that mean? No, I'm not signing that. I feel like if I sign that, you know, you can murder me, and I, I'll be all right. It's okay. No. Boy, sometimes people can sound so smart. They can sound so convincing. He uses the word counselor. He says, listen, you don't, find, don't you let anything separate you from where you know God wants you to be. The devil uses division. He uses discouragement. He uses distraction. He wants to weaken your hands. How does he weaken our hands? By attacking the very thing God is using to build us. Lord, we love you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you for being good to us and blessing our life. Thank you for the church family that you've given us and the opportunity that we have to serve. Lord, I pray that you would remind us often that we have an enemy and he wants to destroy our life. He wants to bring destruction. And God, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful to you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be aware, to be sober, to be vigilant. Because we have an adversary. I pray that you'd speak to us this evening.